Hey everybody, welcome back to Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt. I'm joined by Tyler. How you doing, Tyler? Doing good. Doing good. I I feel lost because last week I had something fantastic just to make fun of you for the entire show, and it went very well. I was, I mean, I was on it, man. I was, I had all the comedic efforts. It was all good. And this week you're using Linux. How boring. I know. I know. <laughs> and it's not like it's any better for me. I mean, to be honest, we all know I tried Mac. I fell in love with it. There was no problems whatsoever. Um, it was just a glorious experience. And now I am just sad to be back on Linux. Back. I really, I really hope the sarcasm comes through on that. Yeah. You came back to Linux and all of a sudden it was like pipe. Wire and Pulse Audio. <laughs> These things are terrible. Why do I want to use those things? I mean, the so funny I'm... part is, is on Mac OS, there was, I, I granted it was because of the M1 chip, but still, there was just as many issues with audio as there was with Pulse. So it's really not like Mac's got any advantages on Linux right now with yeah, their and... latest stuff. I've used Windows before. They have just as many audio problems, too. If you try to connect a Bluetooth device on Windows, it's just as painful it is, as it is on on Linux. It's just it's not a good experience. Bluetooth is just horrible all around. I don't think anybody does it right. All right, so this is the Linux cast. We talk about, you know, Linux. Uh, and usually we start off the show by asking, what have we been doing this week on Linux? And last week, I couldn't ask you that question, but this week, I can. So, Tyler, what have you been doing on Linux this week? Um, well, for the past day and a half, I have, uh, been back in Linux. I went straight back to Fedora, um, just because I knew I could get it up and running and it worked and I could get some work done on the game. Um, it was working perfectly fine up until, uh, like this morning it pipe wire just for some reason, only detected my microphone, and that's it. And there, I tried reverting to Pulse. I tried a whole bunch of different things. It just wouldn't work. So now I'm back on Arch. Arch is running, as per usual, fantastic. Um, back in Qtile, and um, I didn't have that much time to get my configs set back up, do that much messing around. I just had to get everything installed and ready for the podcast and make sure the audio was working. Um, so... Yeah, that's what I've been doing, distressing, trying to get my Arch install ready for this podcast. And I appreciate your dedication. I, I, I've, been prepa- <laughs> I've, see, I've been preparing to hop again because of issues, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, I re- refuse to do it and tell the podcast I'm going to do it tonight. That way, because I knew if I hopped beforehand and things went wrong which they would go wrong <laughs> because of mm-hmm. course they would. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, I just didn't want that to be something that I had to put up with. Um, but yeah, I'm hopping too. So you're you're using Qtile, or you you said you went to Arch. You're using Vanilla Arch. Mm-hmm. Yes, Vanilla Arch. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. never I've never used Arco or any other spinoff um, distro. Uh, I what, what's the one that's just systemd free? Um, I think it's Artix. Artix, yeah. I have tried Artix, um, but I don't know. I just stick with the main line. Um. I put up a poll, because uh, on the stream, by the way, that stream ended up being four hours long <laughs> on Sunday night. Uh, I'm still tired. Uh, but uh, So Sunday night I streamed trying to install Gen 2 in a virtual machine. The virtual machine was actually the culprit of why it failed, because it just froze in the background. That's the reason why it stopped. Um, but I, I was discussing some of the problems and you remember last week I was having, uh, just a crap ton of Linux problems. I was having the problems with OBS. I had the problems with PyCom. Uh, I fixed the problems with OBS. Uh, that is, uh, done. Uh, I don't know how I fixed it, but it's fixed. I uh, don't, like, don't ask me what I did. I don't, I don't know. The PyCom thing was, was fixed with an update. So that was, that's done. The only thing I'm still having an issue with is, um... Some of my USB devices just randomly stop working. Like, um, sometimes my key, computer starts... See, I, and it's been going on for a while. I thought it was Qtile, because it was only ever only ever happened in Qtile. Mm-hmm. Uh, but recently, I actually started doing it in DWM, too. And I don't know what's going on. I, I'm hoping and praying that uh, nuking and paving this uh, version of Linux, you know, um, 
fixes the problem. Because if it doesn't, that means it's a hardware problem, and then I just mm-hmm. might as well die. Uh, <laughs> I, to, I mean, the only thing, the only way to fix it, then I would think, would be to re- replace the um, motherboard, right? And, and I mean, and once you get into problems, like when it comes to motherboard issues, you're uh, in my experience, especially if you're someone who's going to replace like your own hardware, like you're not going to go out and buy a pre-built or something like that. Um, most likely you're going to get down in there, replace the motherboard. And that's always when you're like, well, if I'm going to replace the motherboard, there's this thing that I could replace, or I've been meaning to upgrade like, this. I've already thought about it. I was like, if I have to replace the motherboard, I'm getting a new case. Cause the, I have the, the H510 mm-hmm. from, uh, NZXT. And the airflow in it is horrible. I mean, it's just horrendous. My yeah. my uh, my um, temperatures and it always run about twenty degrees more than what it should because I have water cooling in there. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's, Damn. it's yeah, it's not good. It's like right now the the temperatures at sixty degrees Celsius, which I mean it's not horrible or anything, but it sh- with water cooling and just running OBS or whatever, it should be at least ten degrees lower. Yeah, so let, airflow, let's be honest. You're essentially idling the machine right now. Like yeah, yeah I mean, OBS is running, but it. You probably don't have that many programs open, like. Oh, well, that's not true. I have fire, I have like three instances of Firefox, and I have a ton of stuff open. But still, it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be that um, high. But still, yeah. I was like, if I had to replace the motherboard, you know, I might as well go ahead and place replace the case because I have the case that I want picked out, and it's like Ooh. it's in stock. It's 150 bucks. And I'm like I might as well just do that too because I'm gonna have to rebuild it anyways. I was like, <laughs> and then I was thinking, well, you know what? I don't really care for this air cooler or this water cooler, so I'm gonna go ahead and get the, a new AIO too. And then I was like, well, you know, if I'm going to do that, I might as well get some remember. And by the time I'm done, I'm going to rebuild the whole damn computer. It's going to be ridiculous. Yep. Uh, the only thing I'm going to be able to obviously do is replace the graphics card because you can't get one. <laughs> you, there is no chance. I, I went in there and then, so I was talking with a guy to get this laptop. This uh, this is a Dell G5. It's got a Ryzen 7 and a 5600M in it. So the new mobile um, AMD chips uh, or graphics chips. Um, um, and I was talking with a guy there, and uh, so I was like, when it comes to graphics cards, I would like to buy one, but you don't have any in stock, do you? He goes, of course not. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, um, so when it comes to like a pre-built or a laptop, what's the best bang for buck? Uh, I, I don't want to spend like over or that much over a thousand dollars at all. And he put me on this one and he goes, this is the only laptop that we have in stock. Um, it, we have two. Um, and most likely if you don't buy it in the next three hours, um, it'll probably be gone. Uh, he goes, the display model, uh, he, or he, got, he, he pointed me over if they had another Island that, that was apparently at one point filled with gaming laptops and they're all empty. He's like, yeah, we sold the displays. Like, everyone's buying like, graphics cards any way they can get them. Like, I understood, like, a year ago when everybody was working from home, but everybody's going to fucking back to work now. I mean, why the hell are people <laughs> buying computer parts so much now? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, and we can't, we cannot blame the entire graphics card thing on Bitcoin. Like, no, in, no. In, in the grand scheme of things, how many people are really out there, you know, mining Bitcoin? Because, mm-hmm. first of all, Bitcoin's own. Is mostly done on the those cards that are made specifically for uh, Bitcoin. The, it's the, yeah, the ASICs. It's the it's the Ethereum or whatever that's mined on GPUs still, and that's not. I mean, I, I like I could walk out to the living room room and ask my family if they've ever heard of Ethereum, but I don't think that they have. So the vast majority of people haven't. So I mean, we can't blame it all on that. So it has to be a combination of that chip shortage or whatever, and people wanting gaming. I mean, thing. I mean. Well, I think there's also a lot of people who are now, um, even though people are going back to work, I know there are, uh, I'm not saying every company or most companies are, but I know there is a lot of companies that have now switched to, e- even if they still have an office, most of their employees um, have the option to work at home for a majority of the time. So um, I think a lot of people are, it, it may be a thing of people are now starting to have the ability of working on their own machines. So they get one that they can, you know, game on and do everything else as well as work on. Um, yeah. That might be the case, but that's a good point. Um, I don't know. So anyways, so you move back, <laughs> you move back to arch and uh, you're using Qtile. Uh, the poll I put up, uh, 
apparently Void Linux has decided to be the winner. Uh, I thought as much as the my the commenters and on my on the YouTube channel were going on and on about Gen two, I thought for sure that <laughs> Sabion or Calculate would win, but Void ended up winning uh, by a hefty margin by like over twenty points. Um, I was surprised when I clicked on it to see that Void was so high because I clicked on Calculate because I, I wanted to see Calculate and I assumed because we were talking about Gentoo so much, yeah, I thought somebody so. would, like, we'd all be picking it, but no. I, I thought so too. Um, the thing is, is I'm kind of regretting putting the poll now because I really don't want, I, like, I tried to install Void in a virtual machine and it was a failure. Like, I couldn't get it to actually load. But I don't think that it's Void's problem. This is the second virtual machine I've created now after the Gen 2 one that has been a complete failure. There's something going on with my VirtualBox install, and I don't know what it is. So I'm having a feeling that it, uh, if I go through and try to install this on hardware, I'll be, I'll be more successful. So that's what I'm going to be working on this evening is installing Void Linux. Linux. Whether or not I uh, stick with it for any amount of time, I don't know, because I'm very, very worried about package availability. Because this, yeah. like, it's it, it's an independent distro, kind of like Solus, and Solus is a great distro. I mean, it's really good. It's really stable. Uh, the people behind it are fantastic. But if you want to install programs, <laughs> and you I mean, yeah, there are no programs. <laughs> I mean, they, they have the the main ones, but if you have something that you want that's uh, you know a little bit out there, it's not going to be there. And that's what I'm worried about with Void. Uh, uh, whether or not that's the case, like I said, I don't know. I know, <laughs> like. I've tried hopping before, man, and every yeah. time I was like, "There's a little voice in my head, A U R, A U R, A U R." Like you know, it's gonna happen. Oh man, I'm gonna miss the. And, and the thing is, I was looking at Garuda this morning because uh, the the Destination Linux guys were talking about their top two distros so far of the year, and Garuda was one of them that they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, it looks, at least their KDE one looks nice. I, I thought, I was like, you know, if their KDE one, KDE one looks so nice, uh, maybe I'll try one of their window manager ones. But the K, their window manager ones are kind of ugly. I mean, they're not really well all that uh, optimized. So I was really kind of disappointed in that. But if, and I don't, like I was looking at it, like it has a whole bunch of like gaming packages. I just don't know if I would ever use, but I don't know. Void is gonna. Mm -hmm. Void is gonna see me this this evening. I've gotten everything all backed up that I need. I need to do, um, and I have it on a USB key. I'm just, you know, all I gotta do is press the button. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, well, I wish you the best on your journey. <laughs> yeah, uh, chances are tomorrow I'll be right back on Arch. I mean, it, it, yeah. th there's a there's a good like 75, 25 percent chance that. It, <laughs> that I'm going to be back on Arch tomorrow, uh, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, never know. Maybe it'll be good. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, I, maybe uh, if Void won't work, I'll try Artix because I've been tr wanting to try one without SystemD for a while. Just because everybody goes like, "Oh, SystemD is so horrible," you know. I want to try. Like, I don't understand that. We'll have to do that a topic someday when we talk about the whole SystemD is evil thing. But uh, like, uh, that will have to be a longer podcast because I have a feeling that we could go on for a little bit about I it. I have a feeling too. Um, but I, I was like, well, what the hell? I'm going to try one without system B. Anyways, okay, so uh, 20, minutes, 20 minutes in, we, we were first out of the first first thing, but it's okay. Uh, moving on to the contact information, you can follow us on Twitter at LinuxCast. You can subscribe to our audio feeds and everything at LinuxCast.org. Uh, I've been promising a website for months, uh, and it took a step closer this week. I actually opened up a Linode account. All I have to do is go through and actually install WordPress, and we'll have a website. So, uh, yeah. one step closer. And I've also been promising an actual email address that's not a Gmail account. And guess what? You can contact us at email at thelinuxcast.org. It's done. Uh, it, that's what it, I'm talking about. It, like, it cost me $20 a year, but it's done. Uh, just because I decided just to host it right with, um, with the domain or whatever. Uh, I like hover. It's fine. Uh, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast if you'd like to pitch in towards our hosting, you know, costs and shit. Uh, you can follow uh, Tyler on Odyssey and YouTube. Both of those links will be in the YouTube description. Uh, they're horrendously looking links, so I just have to point you towards the, the description. Uh, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash linuxcast. Uh, every week, we select a news link each. And this week is no different. So, Tyler, why don't you tell us what your news link is? Well, mine is in regards to DXVK. Um, DXVK has just come out with a 
new version and it's um, got a lot of improvements. Um, the main thing that I was looking at is um, like it's it's improved a lot apparently with uh, latency like uh, frame latency um, and um, like the buffer um, the way it handles um, the buffers um, for um what is it? Direct X nine, I believe um, is, has been like much improved. And so it's like um, with all of these improvements, it's helped I- improve the caching um, and fixed numerous bugs. Um, and they have a list at the very bottom of the article where they talk about um, uh, the games that you'll definitely um, see that the performance has improved. Um, GTA's in there, Spec Ops The Line, um, and Days Gone. So there's quite a few AAA games that see a heavy performance improvement. And I love, I, I love hearing about articles like this because I am not smart enough to understand anything about how this is done, how it's figured out, how it works, but I am very happy to see that there is a at least decent portion uh, of people out there that spend their time on it and work and do these kinds of things. It's what makes Linux great. Yeah, I agree. Um, it seems like uh, at least once a week there's this kind of announcement where we just see some kind of update to something that you're right, I don't understand either. But it goes through and just makes Linux better, um, and makes Linux gaming better. Uh, like 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 last week, it was the Nvidia DLSS stuff or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, it's that uh, Linux gaming. It's the year of the Linux desktop. You know, <laughs> I yeah. mean, I don't know if I don't know if you've seen Windows 11, but <laughs> like, oh, dude, I think God, I, that's so bad. Uh, like I. It's Windows 10 with rounded corners, man. It's just you know, I mean, like, and you know that they're gonna charge money for that, right? <laughs> like they're mm-hmm. gonna charge money for that. I watched um, uh, Mudahar on YouTube. He uh, was went over it yesterday, and he's just like, "Oh, you gotta sign in to have any of this stuff to work." Like, uh, oh man, use <laughs> Linux. <laughs> well, uh, that's the thing about Windows 11 that sort of scared me. I don't know if you saw it, but. Um, it seems like if they're going to continue the route, almost every major, like very popular distribution is going to have sort of a GNOME style look to it, like yeah. rounded corners everywhere. The uh, just the bounciness, like the bouncy animations, just everywhere. Like, well, well it's either going to look like that, or it's going to have the center dock of a Mac OS kind of look. You know, <laughs> like, like, there have to be other. User interface paradigms than these two, right? There has mm-hmm. to be, right? But we just, I, I think it's familiarity, right? People are just so familiar with those two. Like either you're a Mac guy or you're a Windows guy, and it, you know, that's if if you went to, uh, I don't know if you know who Paul Thorod is. He's the a guy who covers mm-hmm. Windows. Um, he's on one of the Leo Laporte podcasts. That's how I know him. Um, but uh he, he covered this windows 11 stuff and in the comments of his articles or whatever people are just freaking out about the fact that the start buttons in the center like, like <laughs> they're free i mean it, like it, they're just freaking the fuck out it's it, it's it's hilarious um and, and, and like it, people just reply like you can change like you can change like mm-hmm. if you if you have an activated version of Windows at least you can you can change that and move the start button back to where it is on the left hand side. But in that case, why did you buy Windows 11? You just have Windows <laughs> 10 now, like with rounded corners. That's all that's different. Um, and, and then I tweeted out something yesterday, uh, a, a picture of Windows 11, but with a picture of like the the, the device manager or something like that on there. It still looks like it's from Windows 98. Like this is when, <laughs> this, this, welcome to Windows, man. This is hilarious. All right, I, we got that was that was yeah. a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, we gotta get back to yours. <laughs> we haven't even got there yet. All right, um, let's see. Um, gotta move to the the. the Right scene. So my uh, news link is Linus Torvalds wants everyone to get vaccinated and stop believing anti-vax conspiracies. Uh, this is from It's Foss. Basically on the li- the Linux um, kernel mailing list, somebody was going on about anti-vaxxing and not believing in the whole coronavirus vaccine or whatever. And Linus Torvalds and 
typical Linus Torvalds uh, fashion, lit into them with a whole bunch of like facts and stuff like that, and then told them to get the hell off the the, the <laughs> mailing list because they're being an idiot. Um, it, it was great. Um, I, I know a lot of people have a problem with the way Linus goes through and uh, talks a lot of times because he's very, very blunt. He's always mm-hmm. been blunt, and he got in trouble for it a couple of years ago where he had to take time off and take anger management course. So I was like, oh, that's so fucking stupid, man. Like, he's he's angry. He's an angry man. Just let him be. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's hilarious about 90% of the time. You know, um... <laughs> and and here's one thing I will say. He is very like if you've watched interviews of him, he is a very he's upfront about the fact that he he knows he can be abrasive and he he knows he's argumented it. Like he knows who he is and his personality and he's not he, he he's upfront about it. You can't really be mad at the guy for being himself. Like I mean, obviously, some people can get mad at him, but I, I just want to—I just want to read this. Please keep your insane and technically incorrect anti-vax comments to yourself. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what my RNA is, and you're spreading idiotic lies. <laughs> Maybe you do so unwittingly, but because of bad education. <laughs> Maybe you do so because you've talked to experts, quote unquote, and watched YouTube videos by charlatans that don't know what they're talking about. But damn it, regardless of where you got in your misinformation, any Linux kernel discussion list isn't going to have your idiotic drivel pass on contested from me. <laughs> Vaccines have saved people's lives and literally tens of millions of people. Like that's just—I mean, <laughs> there are put downs and then there's this. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> like it's so good. Um, it's definitely—it's definitely. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, we we, we can make this a little bit of a broader discussion because I, I actually talked about this a little bit on this that stream. Is that? Um, in the on like Linux YouTube channels and the in the Linux community or whatever, for whatever reason, there are just certain people who want to bring in their political beliefs or whatever into the discussion. I'm like, mm-hmm. keep that shit away from me. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't give a damn what you believe. That it doesn't. It has no bearing on <coughs> Linux whatsoever. Oh. <laughs> you know, so like just just. Leave me alone. I don't care. I, w- I want to talk about GNOME versus KDE a little bit, okay? That's as, mu- that's as political as I want to get. I don't want... Like, I don't care. I mean, if you don't want to get a, a corona vaccine, you know, by by all means, whatever. I don't I don't particularly care. I mean, I got one. I was sick as a dog for the last two days. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm getting better, and then uh, in like a week and a half, I can go to the store without a fucking mask. And not, yeah. and not feel like a douchebag, you know? <laughs> you know? That was my whole goal. Like, I don't want to... It's like 90 degrees outside. I, I do not want a freaking oven on my face. I mean, that's mm-hmm. why I got the vaccine. <laughs> like, that's the, like, if there's no other reason, that's a good enough reason. But, I mean, I, I get, it, 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 people are so fucking stupid. See, like, here's the thing. I'm not going to go get a vaccine. But it's not because I think the vaccine's going to kill me or any t- type of crazy bull crap. It's just... I, I barely get out right now. I don't have a re- like in it, and I've got a nice mask. Anytime I do go in somewhere, I can just throw it on. It's really not that big of a deal. I just don't need one. Like I'm not very social. Like it, all the people that I've been going around and hanging out with have either already had it or been vaccinated. So, yeah. I mean, the few friends that I do go out and hang out with, it don't matter. But I also I would not go in like to this person here, what are they think? Like, if you're this type of person that just goes into a Linux forum or a computer forum, uh, mailing list, anything, and just start talking about vaccinations or your political beliefs or what's going on in your town, what is, what are you doing? Like, okay, stay on topic. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, and he had to, have, that person had to have known that he was going to get put down by people. I mean, even if there were people in there that agreed with his beliefs or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. he just had to know. I mean, they just, they're very uh, stern on what they talk about in the Linux kernel mailing list. They talk about mm-hmm. the Linux kernel. That's what they talk <laughs> about. That it, It's not the call, called the Linux kernel and USA Today mailing list. It's called the Linux kernel <laughs> mailing list. You know, it's, it's so dumb. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let, um Moving on to our main topic, which is... I don't even know what our main topic is. What is our main topic today? How long before x86 is an odyssey? So that that was your topic, Tyler. So why don't you take us into it? Mm-hmm. Well, um, 
to be honest, this is one of those topics where I I feel like it's a very interesting topic because it's it's something there's not a hard answer for. It's very speculative, but at the same time, there's a good chance that we in the near future, um, near near future, I'm thinking it probably won't be longer than five years to where most new hardware that's coming out and a lot of the hardware that people are choosing to use is no longer x86. Um, I, I wish I could say that risk five was definitely going to be the thing that took off that soon, but I think risk five will be another decade or two before it's nearly as popular as arm is today, um, in any form. Um, but, I feel like all we need is a push from a company like Apple um, to take that same sort of drive um, with ARM and make their own chips and and do something like that. What do you think? Okay, so this is a tough one. So Apple does things differently. They always have. And they've always done chip transitions very well. I mean, better than literally anybody else. Uh, so... And part of that reason is because they control the whole hardware and software stack, right? They control everything so that they can go through and optimize things the way they need to do it. Uh, there's a reason why Windows on ARM just hasn't taken off is because they Windows doesn't control that hardware stack and they don't do... They've ne- In fact, I'm, po- I'm pretty positive Windows has never done a, 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 a chip transition, you know, like Apple has. They've always been on, you know... Basically, Intel processors. I mean, I might be wrong about that. I'm not old enough to remember the early days of Windows, really. So it's po- it's entirely possible that they've done a trip tran- chip transition. I can't say chip transition, <laughs> uh, whatever. But even if they have, it, it's been ages and ages ago because they've definitely been on x86 since forever. Uh, so uh, and their attempts to go to ARM just have not been uh, successful. Uh, even with their own products, like their Surface X or whatever that was based on ARM, that thing was horrendous. It was not a mm-hmm. good product because they're so entrenched. In, I mean, like, like we talked with the Windows 11 thing where they had the the Windows 98 style device manager on there. I mean, they're so entrenched mm-hmm. in that legacy software stuff and you can't run that stuff on ARM. You, I mean, yeah. you can, you can emulate it, but it's, mm-hmm. it, it, it's not a good experience and nobody wants, I mean... Nobody wants that. So that my answer to the question is, uh, I think x86 is here to stay for quite a while. And my reason is, be- is because people are entrenched in the Windows ecosystem and uh, Microsoft can't do ARM. They can't, they, mm-hmm. they can't do it. Um, I, and, and more at this point, I don't think that they want to do it. I, uh, you know, I think mm-hmm. they see apples and M1. I think they, they, maybe they, they in, in their highest, you know... Um, like like in their dreams, maybe they thought that they could do that, but with the way the e- Windows ecosystem is, they just can't without starting completely over. And they've tried yeah. to start over again. And we've seen now in the last couple of days the next generation of Windows, and it turns Ooh. out it's just Windows 10. So this is they had an opportunity with like Windows X or whatever the thing they were talking about with uh, you know like a Chromebook style thing that could have been the, their opportunity to kind of weed out some of the legacy stuff and try to start moving towards a future where they can, you know, uh, kind of do what Apple has done. Because, I mean, they could go through and have a a more open way of... Because, I mean, they have to deal with their partners or whatever. But there's no reason why they can't work together with those companies and create a good software stack that works well on ARM. There's no reason why they can't. Uh, But... They're not willing to because they need the way that they, they make their money is through the enterprise, and the enterprise is never going to give up their Internet Explorer six or whatever it is they have to use uh, in right, order to right. do stuff. So, uh, I think for the vast majority of consumers, x86 is just going to be here for a long time. Now, the real question is: is will companies like Apple see like a resurgence because? Uh, once we get past this crazy, everybody's buying everything stage. I mean, I don't know where everybody's getting all this money, man. I don't <laughs> understand. The credit card bills from the last year for people just have to be absolutely insane. Oh yeah, the <laughs> amount of debt people have racked up over the past year has got to be 
amazing for co- for you know debt collectors. Like it might just have to. They have to have doubled it. Like from the year four, like it just has to be horrendous. Because I mean, everybody's buying everything. It's it just absolutely insane. But once we get past that point, it'll be interesting to see if because because before the pandemic, you know, PC and Mac sales were going down. And then mm-hmm. everybody had to buy a computer before. Once we get back to, you know, quote unquote normal and people are having regular buying habits or whatever, it'll be interesting to see if Apple, you know, continues to go up because of it, you know, M1 being awesome, or whatever comes next being awesome. Uh, right now, we can't really judge whether or not their, you know, tra- upwards tra- trajectory has anything, anything to do with the M1 because everybody's buying everything. Yeah. Um, now, I have an interesting question for you. How do you think, um, as a business strategy for a company, say, like System76, do you think it would be a good business strategy for them to try and take um, inspiration from Apple and get a do a special ARM chip you know, that they design and try and work um, to develop a open source Linux distribution that is just designed to work on that chip and make that chip the best it can be and have that chip also emulate x86, you know, Linux programs very well. Um, you think that uh, that would be a uh, strategic business uh, strategy? No. Um, mostly because the amount of money that they'd have to put into R and D, I think, would be too high. Um, yeah. Now, what I could see is like like a consortium of of these like hardware manufacturers or whatever that could kind of like pull their resources into it. That could be mm-hmm. like maybe they form a partnership with the Raspberry Pi Foundation or something, um, mm-hmm. where they you know it's just where they kind of pool their economic resources, then maybe it would make more financial sense. Um, Cause obviously it would be open source. So it'd be, you know, it'd be something that they could all work on and all have credit for and all have the license to and whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But as just a solo company, I don't think that it would make financial sense for them. Now, would it be cool? Hell yeah. I think it'd be mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, it'd be as expensive, it, you know, I mean, yeah. 76 is expensive anyways, but it would be really expensive for them because they'd have to, f- I mean, they're in the business of making money. They they can't just throw. Mm-hmm. I mean, with with with, with Apple, it's one hundred percent different because they have trillions of dollars in the bank. You know, they can. You know, mm-hmm. if they if, if they have a project that just doesn't pan out and they've spent a hundred billion dollars on it, like mm, that's no change, big deal. You know what I mean, mm-hmm. uh, System seventy six spends a hundred billion dollars on something like that. They're going out of fucking business. <laughs> you know, yeah. they don't have a yeah. hundred billion dollars to, to work. You know, like, like yeah, they can't they can't do the whole experimental thing. That's why I think it would have to be some kind of uh, split effort. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. and, and it would be kind of, I mean, I mean, it'd be so very the Linux way for them to do their own ARM thing and the Raspberry Pi Foundation do their own thing. And then, the, you know, the, the Enterware or whatever, do their own ARM things. That'd be that'd be the entirely the Linux way of doing things because we love fragmentation. We embrace it with everything. I mean, that's the reason why we have 12 million different package managers. Uh, mm-hmm. But if, if they were, if it was a smart community, they'd go through and say, "You know what? The Raspberry Pi and RISC Five and all these companies or whatever they've gone through and put in all this effort so far. Let's go ahead mm-hmm. and pull in resources into that uh, and mm-hmm. see where we can go. And we'll just ha- we'll all agree to use this one architecture, you know, and mm-hmm. build on from there. Uh, but I don't." <laughs> I think we probably will see more and more focus on ARM in the Linux community uh, in terms of hardware in the next five years. Uh, but I am 100% positive that it's going to be as much of a fragmented mess as everything else is in Linux. And I say that being the biggest Linux fanboy in the world. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of what worries me about everyone being so... Um, excited for Linux on the M1 chip even though Linux might run on that piece of hardware, let's be honest, the reason why the M1 chip performs as well as it does is because Apple has spent the R&D to, and the software side to match the hardware. Um, Linux is, yeah, you're going to get it to work. I know that, I know with the, the Linux community can get Linux to work on anything. Like, it's going to happen. It's just, I don't think Linux... 
in the same sort of paradigm as M1 can work unless we have a company like Apple in the Linux space with Apple-like resources to do it. Um, yeah. I, I shouldn't say li- – I didn't mean like Apple. I just meant with the resources of Apple. Mm-hmm. So, well, The problem – I mean, like I said, the problem with the Linux community is that they just don't – they don't work together very well at all. At least – I mean, they do in some areas – Right. I mean, mm-hmm. they can work. It's not it's not as if uh, Fedora and Ubuntu are bitter enemies or anything. They work together on yeah. GNOME. They do mm-hmm. do that. But they also don't put effort into the same thing. So, like, um, for many years, they were had competing future display servers. Like, they had Wayland and they had Mir. Right, mm-hmm. both of them were the future. Both of them were replacements for Xorg. Obviously, Wayland has won, and Mir is dead. Um, but you know, just because they two work together, or you know, they work together more now because Ubuntu uses GNOME, uh, they still always have competing projects. You know, snaps, mm-hmm. flat packs. I mean, that's the biggest yep. example you have right there. They have competing because they don't agree on how the future of Linux package management should do. I mean, and, it's, and that's every Linux distribution. So, I mean, I don't see how the only way we're as a community, we'd ever be able to at least get up to the point where we have enough resources to do that kind of stuff would be to do it together. And I just don't see uh, that level of cooperation uh, anywhere in the uh, Linux community at the current moment, and it, and I don't like, I don't see that happening anytime soon, and and it's like it's a, it's a sad thing because, you know, you, your experience with the M1 was amazing, right? I mean, you thought it was just mm-hmm. absolutely out of this world, um, and I think we had if we could have that kind of experience with Linux, it'd also be really awesome. Um, I just I don't see how would the the thing is though. Is maybe we don't need the hardware, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. possible that the Raspberry Pi Foundation is going to save us all, because they're going through and they're creating little boards with ARM processors that can do an awful lot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay, sure, you're not going to go play Grand Theft Auto Five on the damn thing, but you know what? Expectations. It costs thirty dollars. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so and they. It seems like every time a new Raspberry Pi comes out, it doubles in performance. You know, and mm-hmm. so it's possible. And, and Linux runs really well on it. And there's a lot of software that you can get to run on Linux on ARM. It, mm-hmm. It's there, um, and it's always getting better. And I think that if we can get to the point where the Raspberry Pi can actually truly be someone's computer, like maybe not for gaming, mm-hmm. but for everything else, you know, mm-hmm. and we're close. You know, you could use that Raspberry Pi 400 as a daily driver. You know, yeah. if you could put up with a crappy computer, the crappy keyboard, you know, it's, yeah. you know if it had a good keyboard on it, I think it would have been really popular. Um, but I mean, like, let's be honest, if you took your mechanical keyboard out, you could slap a Raspberry Pi 4 in the bottom of it, drill some holes for the ports, and well, you're on and your we way. Have, like, we have 3D printers, like, it could work. You know, yeah, like, yeah. like oh, we, we got this, like, uh, that... That's my like kind of proviso on this whole thing because I think that the Raspberry Pi, Pi Foundation and the the Raspberry Pi is just something that could really save Linux because I mean they're working on it and mm-hmm. they seem to be the everyone seems to agree that that's the development board right now to be you know worked on like yes Nvidia has their thing yes Risk Five is doing something. Uh, you know, there's there's another there's a few other like development boards or whatever. But uh, when you think small computer that uses for Linux, that you think Raspberry Pi, um, and it's just so unbelievably popular. And I think that that right there is going to lead to the software side of things kind of being pushed forward. Because I mean, everybody's very interested in making sure that the there's something that you can run on a Raspberry Pi. And you know, like this last one, they got full-on Ubuntu working on it. They got, like, Ubuntu Mate. I'm sure... I know Manjaro Arm works on it. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. they're... I mean, once you start getting the fact that... Once you start getting distro maintainers looking at actually making Arm versions, I think that's a success. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. So, that's where we are. 
Um, whether, whether or not we'll ever get to the point where we can game on a Raspberry Pi? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I mean, a Raspberry Pi that I, I definitely can see may, it may be a little bit longer than five years down the line, but I can definitely see a Raspberry Pi coming out with the graphics performance of something like a 750 Ti, something like that. Yeah. Um, now, granted, it's definitely going to be at that point, it's going to have you know, some type of cooling on it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it needs cooling on it now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. If Apple can, I mean, Apple seems to be focused on focusing on built-in graphics, which is an absolute shame because if they had managed to pull in uh, NVIDIA and um, AMD in terms of getting uh, dedicated, discrete graphics working with ARM, that would be awesome. And it, mm-hmm. and it would be a boon for the Linux community too, because if they got managed to do that work for Apple, it's possible that they could translate that work towards allowing those dedicated graphics to work with an ARM-based Linux machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if we can get to the point where we have a, a like, I'm not an engineer, I have no clue what I'm talking about. Uh, it <laughs> may be impossible to have an ARM work with a. Um, a dedicated graphics uh, processor unit, uh, GPU. Um, but if it is possible, that'd be really awesome. But it doesn't seem like Apple's going that direction, which is, like I said, kind of disappointing. Because if they if they could have kind of kickstarted that effort, uh, it would have made the ARM race even better. Because anybody with an, who develops an ARM chip could also then also maybe use a dedicated graphics card. And it would have it would have been great, eh? but I don't like I said I don't think they're going to go in that direction. No. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a good uh, a good little topic. Um, mm-hmm. Let's go ahead and move on to our picks of the week. So, Tyler, why don't you tell us about your picks of the week? Mine uh, is the Apple file system for Linux. It's essentially just a little driver that you can install. It's extremely easy to install. It's not difficult at all. Um, And then so I I mainly am sharing this not because maybe you want to use the Apple file system. I would assume if you're a Linux user, you don't want to. And it's, it's not like it's that special anyway. But if you're someone who is switching over from uh, a Mac or you have a family member that wants to switch over from using a Mac, anything, this is insanely useful. You'll need it to be able to recover any files that you have backed up on another hard drive. And at first, it was looking like it, something like this, being able to access my drive and copy files over from it was going to be pretty difficult. But luckily... Um, this made it super simple. Um, you literally just install this and then mount the drive like you would any other drive and go about your business. Um, so that kind of allows because um, Apple uses that weird journal file system, whatever. Yeah, uh, APFS is what they call it. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Obviously not something I'd use because you'd never catch me dead using a Macintosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I won't use it again. I just needed it to copy over my files. And right. now that drive's been reformatted to, a, I don't know, a reasonable file system. Right. But anyway. Well, it was an experience for you, man. Was, it, uh-huh. I at least gave it a try. Uh, definitely. I definitely am not sticking with it. I would have went without a computer long before I used a Macintosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, although I would have used a Mac before I used Windows, so I mean, I guess there's levels of my, uh, you know, in a, in a, you know, not wanting to do things. All right. Mm-hmm. So normally for me, I always try to pick an application or something that is open source, uh, and that's just kind of to go along with the theme. But this time I didn't, and it's sad. Mine mm-hmm. is called Mimo, and Mimo is an Android application that you can. Well, it's also on iOS, but. I mean, whatever. Um, you can use it on uh, your phone, and it allows you to learn programming. So I've been using it to learn Python. And I, I said I was going to learn Python, and um, the problem is when I sit down in front of my computer, uh, there's YouTube. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and there are other things to do on my computer, and there's gaming and stuff like that. So I, I, I have no financial reason to actually you know, learn Python, but on my phone, like just when I'm using my phone it and I can open up Mimo, it's a gamified experience. So you can go through and like earn points and stuff like that. So it's really cool. Okay. Um, and it allows you to, to learn Python. It also has, uh, 
stuff for JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So um, I'll probably go through those as well. Now, like I said, this is not open source, so uh, that's a, a downside. It is also uh, very limited in terms of what you can do for free. So uh, if you want to get all the courses, you have to pay, and it is a little pricey. Uh, now they have how they, much? Uh, they have deals all the time. Uh, so forty dollars a year um, okay. is the thing. So it's not. I mean, it's not the most expensive thing in the world. But for uh, as as we talked about last week, people don't like paying th- for things. If you want to mm-hmm. get through and actually get all the courses, you do have to pay for them. Uh, if you had to pay full price, it'd be sixty dollars a year. So uh, again, but I mean, and I'm going to assume they are coming out with more courses all you the know, time. pretty frequently. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and it, it's not the most well-designed app in the world, but it's not like unusable. There's a lot of the thing that bothers me. Like I'm not a designer, but there's a lot of white space in it, and that bothered me a little bit. Uh, but um, but otherwise, it's actually really good. I'm still in the beginning phases of it. I have not paid for it yet because I wanted to go through and do the free stuff first. Um, make sure it's all good. Yeah. Well, that and make sure I'm actually going to stick with it because I don't want to pay for forty dollars for a year and then you know a week from now like. I'm going to go back and play Clash of Clans. You know, this is not uh, fun, you know? So, uh, that That's definitely a thing. I, so, I mean, this is definitely... If you want to learn how to code and you can't trust yourself in front of a computer... Because, I mean, I've tried to learn how to code before, and I got went into a rabbit hole. Oh, what's the best IDE I could use? Let's go ahead and get all these Vim plugins. Like, I never got around to learning how to code. I was like, like let's, let's go ahead and install all these Vim plugins to make this Vim the best IDE possible. You know, and then by the time, by the time I was like, I got that all set up or whatever, I no longer wanted to learn how to code. So, uh, and you got all these useless Vim plugins. So I've been trying out Lunar Vim. Lunar Vim is a, uh, They've taken the the guy has gone through and rewritten everything for NVim in Lua because NVim now or NeoVim mm-hmm. starts it now supports Lua right and he mm-hmm. has just all these plugins it's like like what am I going to use any of this stuff for like, I don't even know <laughs> uh, like it's really cool and it reminds you of like uh, like the, my little time with Emacs or whatever there's like a ton of stuff in it like it's really cool but it's just total overkill for anything I would possibly do. Um, but uh, with the, the with the memo thing, at least you're you know kind of focused. But and also uh, the really cool thing about it is that it will send you reminders, so that you can do this every day. So it'll remind you, like say okay. at two o'clock every day, do your Python course. And it only takes takes like three four minutes to actually do the course because then each one's like 10, 10 steps long or whatever. Um, okay. It's been really cool. Um, so that yeah, that's def- that's my pick. Um, We'll see whether or not I pay for it, but we'll. Um, so far, it's looking likely because it's been hmm. kind of fun. Yeah, we'll also see how good your Python is. Well, we'll see. I mean, so far, I've learned how to store variables. That's as far as I've gotten. So, um, the, the, the the thing about storing variables is it's pretty much the same in every <laughs> every language. So, is it like this equals this? This is a this is a this is a variable. You know, so that's basically the, as far as I've gotten. But um, I've started. Which is definitely more than I could have said, you know, a few days ago. So that's that's my pick. So uh, that is it for us this time. Next time on the Linux Cast, which if I can get my freaking keyboard to work, why are my freaking I'm so sick of USB things not working? Mm. All right, it doesn't matter. You see, the problem with using a tiling window manager is when your keyboard stops working, you can't move to a different workspace without using your You've mouse. You've got big problems. You're screwed. All right, so the next topic is why is Linux hardware so ex- damn expensive? So, uh, yeah, we're going to probably be talking about System76 quite a bit there, but they're not the only mm-hmm. culprits. Uh, you, they're really not. You can there are l- many. And I kind of also want to talk during that one is why is Linux hardware uh, like manufacturing is so segmented. So like, there are a ton of great like Linux hardware manufacturers that are in Europe, and you can't buy that shit here. Like, oh really? Yeah, like like there's like Entraware, and there's a couple other ones that are like uh, Spanish or German or whatever, and they have like um, they're a little you know they're a little pricey. They're not nearly as pricey as System Seventy Six, but you can't buy that stuff over here without importing it like through somebody else. As far as mm-hmm. I know, like I haven't been able to figure out how to do it because they're like, um. Like, they have no uh, mechanism. Like, some of it's, like, entirely different languages. Like, you can't 
get it in English at all. And then the, um, they have different keyboard layouts and stuff like that. And that's fine. Like, we have System 76 like here for us, but it seems like they're the only ones for us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, unless you want to yeah. buy Dell. And good luck trying to find a Dell laptop with Linux on it. They bury that shit like a redheaded stepchild. Mm. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that is it for us this time. Make sure you... Uh, follow us on Twitter at the Linux Cast. You can follow me on Twitter at TMTWB. Before I go, I should uh, actually shout out all of our patrons Devon, Marcus, Meglin, Donnie, Sven, East Coast Web, Merrick, Camp, and Mitchell. Thanks everybody for watching. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Linux Cast, and we will be back next week. We'll see you then. See ya.